Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette, discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free, <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 101 of Movie Oubliette, the bi-hemispherical podcast for forgotten fantastical films with me, Conrad, sitting in a posh shed in Cambridge, UK. Mm. And me, Dan, returned from yet another holiday, this time in treacherous Tasmania, but now back in Melbourne, Australia. We focus on sci-fi, fantasy and horror films for the most part because we love rocket ships, explosive decompression and Christmas miracles that solve water shortages. Hello, Dan. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yes. I'm I'm back at work, so so obviously very despondent about that. But I I, I had a good holiday. And how's Tasmania and were there any devils? Uh, We didn't see any devils. We did see a lot of wildlife, though, a lot of birds. Mm. Um, And apparently someone saw a a patamelon, which is a a type of marsupial, kind of similar to a a small kangaroo, but fatter. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Apparently they saw one. uh, Oh, um, wow. But yeah, it was it was a good time away. We um, we stayed at an Airbnb. Uh, we ate a lot of delicious food, played some games, and and saw the sights. Well, that sounds like fun. So how I've been? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how's your shed going? A little bit uh, more posh than the shed. I would say. Just a little bit, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so meanwhile, I've been trudging backwards and forwards across my garden with armfuls of stuff slowly kitting out my new studio room. Ah, yes. um, but uh, you will see it in live streams if we do more of those. But yes, it's uh, it's all set up now and I'm very, very happy with it. It's a lovely sort of movie watching stroke studio space. It's very nice. Yeah. I mean, I commented and I did describe it as it looks like one of those bookshops that you go in and sit on the couch and have a nice cup of coffee (laughs) and read a book. It looks very comfortable. (laughs) I just need a coffee machine. Yes, at work when I was on meetings, people did ask me if it was like a stock photo backdrop (laughs) or whether I was actually here. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it it has that very newly sort of... uh, uh, built, um, arranged look. Uh, it hasn't hasn't got that worn in look yet. No, it doesn't. No, it's got the bamboo plant and the clean wood floor, and <laughs> yeah, it's all very IKEA catalogue, isn't it? Yeah, it just needs a few st- stains where I've tripped up and dropped something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but not yet. Yes, mm. I mean, this is our hundred and oneth, hundred and oneth, hundred and one episode. <laughs> 101st? Is that what you would call it? I think so, yes. But I did want to mention a few <laughs> things from the live stream of our 100th episode um, because mm-hmm. it was a bit hard to juggle, like reading comments and doing the live, and then we had guests on, and uh, it was, yeah, a lot of things. But uh, uh, there was a, a lot of talk about your hair, Conrad, and, and your attire. Oh. A lot of, uh, a lot of <laughs> adoration for that by Wicked Person and Michael and Melinda from Retroblasting and uh, Master <laughs> Sun 42 also uh, mentioned your appearance. Very impeccable, I would say. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to put it down to Zoom filters, but it was just me. <laughs> yeah, it's you, you just being very well dressed. Uh, I also saw a comment that was my favorite comment from someone, um, Bobby L. Collins, and he or she said, I feel like I'm watching BBC News, Flight of the Concords, and Late Night with Jimmy Fallon all at the same time, and I love it. <laughs> And it was when we we had Isaac on, so it was the the trio of us from different continents, yeah, and all our accents. Yes, 
Uh, it was wonderful, wasn't it? I had a really good time, and especially with Serge there too. Mm, mm. It was uh, it was really good fun with the four of us on screen, and I've loved all of the uh, little snippets that Isaac's been editing together and putting out on our socials. Yes, it just reminds me of a good time we had with everyone. So, yes, yes, but back to the normal pod. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, apart from that, anything in the mailbag today, Conrad? Well, uh, after the live stream one hundredth episode, we gained four new patrons so hello to chris ozma so we have the queen of oz listening to us now from Uh (laughs) from all all the way in the emerald city nick long time listener nick and lester so hello to all of you and welcome aboard thanks for your support welcome aboard i hope you saw the live stream On Timothy Dalton's fiery doom in The Rocketeer, Philip Ball said, I preferred his demise in Hot Fuzz. Ah, yes. (laughs) I love that movie. I love that movie. I can quote every line. Doesn't he end up impaled on a model village? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, he does. Actually, I did did see a model village in uh, Tasmania. Um, Did you? (laughs) Yeah, the first one I've ever seen. It was fun. But no Timothy Dalton's in Pale. No, no. No. Uh, talking of The Rocketeer, Louis Saavedra said, Movie magic. I remember watching The Rocketeer at the local cinema and enjoying it from start to finish. Mm. Uh, Sarcastic Asian 003 <laughs> said, Watch The Rocketeer again last night. Uh, that scene, the blimp explosion, held up really well. What an underrated movie. So, yeah, a lot of love for that movie. It really is, yeah. Uh, when we asked, what's your favourite steampunk movie, John M. Rouse suggested League of Extraordinary Gentlemen ah, yes. and Hellboy. Ah, yes. I'd forgotten about League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I don't, I don't recall it being as bad as everyone says it is. I mean, it wasn't good, but it wasn't no. terrible. I mean, yeah, I had I had potential to be much better, but I don't think it was as bad. And it was sad that it was Sean Connery's last movie. Well, I think people take against it because it was the film that famously drove Sean Connery out of the movie mm. business. And yeah. Just <laughs> threw his hands in the air and said, screw this, and just went and played golf for another 20 years or so. And even when Spielberg said to him, come back for Indy 4, he uh, still didn't. Do it. Mm. He said, oh, no, if Spielberg can't lure me out of retirement, nobody will. So, mm. yeah, I think that's why people hate that movie. <laughs> but yeah. I haven't seen it for a while. Yeah, I haven't seen it for a while. So maybe it is terrible. Yeah. Eddie Coulter says, love The Rocketeer. I've been a fan since I first discovered the character in either 1982 or 1983. And here's some bonus trivia. Dan Stevens, the uh, creator of The Rocketeer, Mm. was a pretty stand-up guy. He became friends with Betty Page, on whom the Jennifer Connelly character is based, and helped her to arrange financial compensation from her publishers for the use of her image. There you go. Okay. Looked after Betty Page in her autumn years. Yeah. I don't know whether anyone knows, but Betty Page, uh, she did some bad things. Did she? She she went a bit crazy a little i think she almost killed someone like she stabbed someone in the face or something oh my i i uh, yeah uh google it like betty page has (laughs) done other things (laughs) okay not so nice things (laughs) (laughs) no okay perhaps not the sweet old lady that i was imagining yeah um and uh eddie also says timothy dalton's character neville sinclair was of course inspired by errol flynn and the 80s controversy caused by charles hyam's biography errol flynn the untold story which alleged that flynn spied for the nazis (gasps) oh yeah i did hear about that yeah that's, uh... I think it's been debunked, though. I'm not sure it's necessarily true. But yeah, I know. I mean, everyone thought everyone else was a, a communist at one point, at some point. <laughs> in the, in that, uh... Everybody got blacklisted. Yeah, yeah, back then. Yeah. And just on the streaming, I mean, apart from the comments that you read out, we also heard from Hugo Rioja, who said, Love the streaming. You guys should do that more often. Congratulations for the 100. So thank you, Hugo. Thank you. Maybe we will. Maybe we will. You will see us in Iconicon, and Iconicon is not far away now. I know. 
It's uh, it's really fast approaching. It really is. It's quite scary, but we've got some amazing things in the hopper for that. So, mm. yeah, look forward to that. But what yes. can we look forward to today, Dan? Well, today, uh, I'll just go grab it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm on Mars. Oh. Have I been on Mars before? It's a lot of, <laughs> you might a lot of red dirt around. Hang on, yes. I need to take off my glove to grab the movie. Well, hang on, is that safe? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Here it is. I'm coming back. Hey, no unnecessary floating on my ship. Okay, I've got the movie today. Oh, what do you have? Today we will be discussing the 1955 film Conquest of Space, Ooh. which was uh, graciously gifted to us by Via Vision. Yes, the Australian boutique Blu-ray label that issues loads of amazing special editions of films. You should definitely check them out and import some if you can, if you have a multi-region player. And they were kind enough to give us Conquest of Space so that we could cover it in this episode. Yeah, yeah. So during our live stream, they did give us another option. Uh, what was the other one? Audrey mm. Rose? Um, but, it was um, Audrey Rose, yeah. Yeah, but we took a poll and Conquest of Space uh, was the winner. Yeah, exciting. So we're in the 50s. Yes, I know. This is, I think, the oldest film that we're going to uh, review. So it's directed by mm. Byron Haskin. Haskin, mm -hmm. written by quite a lot of people that I have <laughs> almost too many people to mention, but it stars Walter Brook, uh, Eric Fleming, Mickey Shaughnessy, Phil Foster, Benson Fong, William Redfield, Ross Martin, and William Hopper. Ah, and what happens in Conquest of Space? Is well, space conquered? <laughs> well, five engineers and scientists and uh, one stowaway are tasked with the unthinkable, travelling to Mars. Ooh. After building the spaceship named simply Spaceship, they embark on their perilous <laughs> journey, surviving <laughs> meteor surges and asteroids to crash land on the Martian planet. But their commander-in-chief, General Samuel Merritt, is struck down by space fatigue, sabotages their landing, and releases their water supply. Without water, how will the crew return to Earth? Maybe Martian snow and impromptu earthquakes will help. We'll find out. <laughs> In Conquest of Space. <laughs> it, it has to be said in that voice, doesn't it? I know, I know. Although it never actually happens like that, like with a big reverb, like Conquest of Space. I, I, I was expecting it. It should be. <laughs> yeah, let's get into it. Okay. Okay, we are back to talk about 1955's Conquest of Space. <laughs> I want to uh, start it off by quoting the opening narration. So this is a story of tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, when men have built a station in space, constructed in the form of a great wheel, and set a thousand miles out from the earth, fixed by gravity and turning about the world every two hours, serving a double purpose, an observation post in the heavens, and a place where a spaceship can be assembled, and then launched to explore other planets, and the vast universe itself, in the the last and greatest adventure of mankind, a plunge towards conquest of space. <laughs> so that just sets the scene for the movie, doesn't it? It does, yes. And what I particularly like about it is it is punctuated by a rocket firing when he says, a plunge towards the, and then boom. And you think, were there words missing or yeah. did we miss anything? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's quite sudden, it's quite jarring. It almost sounds like he's about to say a plunge towards the universe, but then it's interrupted and then it comes up with the title card, <laughs> Conquest of Space. Yes. So yeah, this is probably one of the oldest movies, especially sci-fi movies I've ever seen. Mm. I haven't watched a lot of sci-fi pre-60s and 70s. Mm. Uh, I think the only other old sci-fi I've seen is um, 
A Trip to the Moon. Oh, wow. That silent movie, that French movie. Manier, yeah. It's more kind of fantasy, I guess, mm. uh, rather than sci-fi. And also I've seen uh, Forbidden Planet, which is like, I think, came out the year after this this movie came out. Mm. Actually, one more movie I have seen. I attended a movie marathon back in Wellington. It was like a energy drink sponsored movie marathon <laughs> where you just show up and they play four or five movies back to back and they don't tell you what the movies are and they're always like real batch of crazy movies. <laughs> <laughs> and I, wa- I can't even remember the title of the film, but it was some sci-fi 40s or 50s movie with an alien invasion and at one point the aliens were just like people with motorcycle helmets just running around and those were the aliens <laughs> it was a bad movie but um yeah it was a bit of fun but yeah i haven't seen a lot of old sci-fi have you conrad i've seen a reasonable amount but usually the ones that are sort of milestone movies oh. so and many of them from the producer george powell who produced this movie ah, yes. so i've seen things like his 90 1953 movie War of the Worlds. Ah, classic. And his 1960 movie The Time Machine, which I really love and has some Ah. really charming and inspiring and imaginative visual effects in it as well. So I've seen some of the sort of highlights, but I haven't sort of delved into the oubliette films of this era Mm. before. So this is kind of exciting. I was intrigued. I thought everybody on the live stream audience would vote for the 70s Anthony Hopkins reincarnation movie but no they've ah. they've plunged us into the 50s it's quite exciting yeah yeah so this is 1955 as well so this predates mm. the moon landing it predates even the first man in space yeah so i was quite surprised at some of the things that i mean it's not exactly perfect science in this movie. No. Uh, there's, there's a few things that we could talk about. <laughs> but I was surprised at, like, like what did they base the spacesuits on? Like, what did they base um, their idea of gravity on or the spaceships? Like, it's actually quite fascinating, like, being pre actually sending someone into space. Yeah, and it's part of a movement that was an attempt to move away from the space opera stylings of Flash Gordon from the 30s and into a more documentarian, serious, speculative sci-fi. So they were trying to take the predictive science of the time and talking to engineers and um, astrologers or astronomers. I can never remember which one is which. Astronomers. <laughs> one of them is just nonsense. Not the tarot card ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, they were trying to get all the technical expertise that they could get. So in the same way that for contact, they had Carl Sagan working on that movie and mm. Interstellar, I think, had advice from Neil deGrasse Tyson and various other yeah. physicists. So, Sunshine as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Brian Cox, the British guy. Mm. So, yeah, they're trying to take everything that they knew about space at the time and all of their projections into what the space race could be and make a serious documentary style movie rather than a silly space opera with rockets with sparklers flying out of the back of them and lasers yeah and aliens because i was expecting aliens in this movie (laughs) there aren't any aliens it is quite rooted in science i mean to a degree yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there were some faux pas <laughs> along the way. But yeah, for George Powell, this really started with Destination Moon in 1950. So mm. the first big science fiction movie for the decade was a very serious, quite dry look at what a mission to the moon could look like right. long before one actually happened. So that was his first movie. He won an Academy Award for the effects in that. And then he did When Worlds Collide, which is a epic disaster science fiction movie where a planet hits us so sort of melancholia or moonfall style yeah Uh so he won an academy award for that then he did 1953's war of the worlds an adaptation of hg wells which is a landmark in science fiction i still haven't seen that movie and like just looking at footage of that film it's uh, astonishing it's it's really really good it's amazing stuff (laughs) yeah and after that i think he did a biopic of 
about Houdini in 1953 as well, starring Tony Curtis and Janet Lee, mother and father of Jamie Lee Curtis and possibly where they met. I'm not quite sure. Oh. And then 1955, The Conquest of Space, which turned out to be George Powell's last movie with Paramount because it was a bit of a disaster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very tonally imbalanced in parts. Mm. Like there, there's a, a lot of comic relief that does not fit in this movie at all. It feels like you're watching like a Three Stooges sketch or something. <laughs> it's just been shoehorned into this like very science heavy um, more, I guess, more realistic space movie. Yeah, there are a couple of major problems with the script. So the script was based on a book, The Conquest of Space, by Willie Lay and the famous illustrator Chesley Bonestall. Bonestall? I think it's Bonestall. And that was just like a non-fiction book. Like, this is mm. what space travel is going to look like, and we're all going to be in space, and it's going to look like this, and, the you know, the rotating space station, and mm. various things that would end up being very influential in terms of science fiction. So it's based on that, but then you've got the problem of you've, you need a story, yeah, and... Their attempt to come up with a story went through various screenwriters, which is why there was such a long list that you didn't yeah. <laughs> want to read. So many. So many. <laughs> and, and where they've landed in terms of a narrative, it has two things, really. One is you have the captain that goes off the rails and mm. is sabotaging the mission, and you have the comic relief... Uh, what's his name? Siegel. Jackie? Jackie Siegel. <laughs> yes, Sergeant Jackie Siegel, played by Phil Foster, who apparently was a you know great comedic actor in various TV series and so on, mm. and was very successful afterwards. But in this, he's just uh, really irritating and not funny. Yeah, and sort of slapstick humour. Mm. So not even dry humour either. It's just silly yeah he almost seems like a cartoon mm. there's a scene where he has a double take at the food in the mess hall and <laughs> yeah. it's like what is this like bugs bunny i know <laughs> it just seems so out of place it does yeah and it's highlighted with like xylophony plinky plonky music you know blah, 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 whenever he comes on stage again yeah yeah i mean at one point they're trying to select who's going to go on the mission and uh yeah merit says I don't think there's a man on the wheel, referring to the space station, with less formal education than you. And he replies, yes, sir, I sure am ignorant, sir. Mm -hmm. But still they take him on the mission anyway, because he says no one has a better understanding of advanced electronics. But at no point during the movie is this demonstrated. No. He never saves the day with his advanced electronics knowledge. No. I mean, they, they don't really showcase any of their skills throughout the film. <laughs> no. Apart from um, the Asian character, which I was actually quite surprised by. Because, first of all, he is a person of colour. He's an Asian-American character that doesn't have a cliche Asian accent. So his his character name is Emoto, played by Benson Fong. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't get killed off. And he's treated like a normal person. They don't poke fun at his uh, Asian heritage. I think there's only one line that kind of pokes fun a little bit. But apart from that, he's just a normal character that just happens to be Asian. And I I was shocked. Yeah. <laughs> that existed in a film from 1955. None of the cliches that you would expect. No. I, I mean, it's pretty amazing. In terms of the future that it represents, it's surprisingly Star Trek Gene Roddenberry sure. in its vision of a multinational group of people who were educated and adventuresome and wanting to explore mm. the universe, I guess, the mm. conquest of space. Yeah, not multi-gendered, though. Not multi-gendered, no. 100% male. <laughs> yeah, it's a full-on sausage fest on that spaceship. Uh, yes, but it is multicultural. And yes. as one of the commenters on the uh, making of points out, there is actually an African-American, well, certainly there is a black astronaut in the mess hall right. on the space station, which he believes is the first representation of a black person in space wow. in science fiction. Okay. Predating the O.J. Simpson character in Capricorn 1 that we commented on way back in episode 8. Huh. Yeah, it's quite the 
Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek vision of the future mm. and predating Star Trek by 10 years. Interestingly, Byron Haskin, the director of this movie, who worked with George Powell in a number of movies, including War of the Worlds, mm. he was one of the co-producers of the pilot episode of Star Trek, the original series. Right. There is a connection there. Yeah, I did briefly have a look at some of the other films he's done, and he, he is... I mean, I don't know how inclusive he is, but he does tend to include other races in his movies mm. or there'll be in exotic locations that will have to include other races. So it's quite forward thinking in terms of 1955, yeah. let's say. There is one egregious speech in it, which I was sort of curled up in a ball in horror when it came out of Emoto's mouth, which is when he is trying to justify why they should go on the Mars mission. He says, quote, and this is a bit of a long quote, so bear with me. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, my country chose to fight a terrible war. It was bad. I do not defend it. Because he's supposed to be Japanese, right? Yeah, yeah. But there were reasons. To the Western world at that time, Japan was a fairy book nation. Little people living in strange land of rice paper houses. People who had almost no furniture, who sat on the floor and ate with chopsticks. The quaint paper houses, sir, they were made of paper because there was no other material available. And the winters in Japan are as cold as they are in Boston. And the chopsticks? There was no metal for forks and knives and spoons where slithers of wood would suffice. And so it was with the little people of Japan, little as I am now, because for countless generations we've not been able to produce the food to make us bigger. Japan's yesterday will be the world's tomorrow. Do you think that's an accurate representation of the cultural history of Japan, Dan? Well, I didn't think they were that impoverished. Uh, <laughs> and it, it seems like a Western view of Japan from someone that has never been to Japan. <laughs> well, exactly. Like, I mean, like, the... <laughs> like, 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 like you're writing a novel, but you've never actually been there, like, like Biggles or something. <laughs> They're trying to suggest the reason to go to Mars is to discover new materials because there's a material shortage on Earth or something resource shortage sure. and he's saying that japan was using chopsticks because they never found metal to make spoons complete bollocks by the way i looked it up the first chopsticks that have been discovered were metal so this is nonsense and they had spoons so I, it, it's insane yeah and the idea that japanese people are short yeah because they didn't eat enough <laughs> it's just colossally <laughs> stupid yeah I mean, it is a very sort of naive Western view of the world. Like, everything should be how Westerners do things. Like, yeah, they and don't the, and have... the reason it isn't is... Yeah. Yeah, because they don't have the same resources as us. Yeah, yeah, it's... because cultural differences doesn't exist. No. Like, people can't have differences in culture uh, with how they eat food and implements and, 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 you know, materials for housing. No, no, they're just wrong and yeah. sadly lacking in the resources and the wherewithal to catch up no yes. it's it's a western view of the world and and very foolish mm. and i want to say that this isn't a sort of oh let's give it a pass because it's a product of its time this was heavily criticized at the time really that speech ah, yes it was seen as patently obviously dumb mm. that this could anyway pass as an intelligent speech from wow. a human being okay so it's not a product of its time it's just crap right <laughs> right <laughs> Can we talk about themes? I mean, there are some quite heavy themes I found mm. in this film. There was some talk about the difference between exploration and invasion. The idea of God and religion paired with like space travel. How can they both exist? And then you've even got stuff with um, the two Merit characters, the father and son. And they have sort of the conflict between them and and the son feeling like he's trapped, like he's he's been sort of roped into the space mission without his his consent. He he didn't volunteer for this. He just wants to go back home. But then he he rips up his leave slip anyway and he joins the space trip. Yeah. I don't know. There there are some quite heavy, heavy themes interwoven in this movie that I did not expect. I thought it was just going to be a fun romp in space. They go to Mars, they see some aliens and they go home. But there's a lot more to this. It's quite complex layers of, of um, topics that they cover. Yeah, that's, it's very true. I mean, both of them are considered missteps 
by George Pal aficionados and critics generally, the idea that this plot should be driven by a father-son dynamic that doesn't really resolve itself. Well, someone dies. He kills his dad. (laughs) (laughs) That's the easiest resolution, isn't it? Yes, dad goes bonkers, (laughs) so he kills him. And then they lie about how he died so that he can still be seen as a hero mm. after the fact. Yeah. Largely because of the presence of the character played by Mickey Shaughnessy, Sergeant Mahoney, mm-hmm. who is sort of mm-hmm. this stereotypical Irish sergeant character from a World War II movie. Yeah. But there are a lot of World War II movie tropes in this movie. So the father-son dynamic where the father is sort of forcing his son to walk in his footsteps because he's got some vision of what his son's future should should be and he's damn well going to follow it and the Mm. son sort of struggling with that because he's newly married to a woman whose name is actually mentioned once Mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, back home and had to stop decorating their cottage or something because he was leaving I don't know some Mm. there's some sort of tragedy there never see her no and then you have this issue of religion where the Uh, I think there are two things that set you up for, uh uh-oh, this is going to be picked up later. One is after they've introduced this idea of space fatigue, Mm -hmm. which uh, affects a character earlier on before they they select the crew for the actual launch. Somebody becomes paralysed in a non-stressful situation and gets cut from the team. Mm. Shortly after it's been described that it can lead to complete psychosis, you see the father almost faint outside his quarters and have some weird drink that you never find out what it is but he keeps yeah secretly chugging something so that's kind of like the um pressure syndrome that affects the michael bean character in the abyss so it's sort of a hint of uh uh-oh you know Mm. this character's gonna go crazy and then there's a point later on where he takes his bible on the mission and at one point the son says i don't think i've seen you reading the bible quite so much as i have recently and you just think yeah "Mm, put a pin in that that's not gonna end well yeah so yeah yeah. the father just goes into full-blown paranoia that their mission given that it's never mentioned in the bible that man will travel to mars he becomes convinced that they are committing blasphemy yes Uh, Yes. so he just thinks well in that case i'll commit an even greater sin and murder everybody yeah i i I do feel like it is kind of a trope (laughs) that tends to happen in either space movies Or undersea movies Mm. where someone just goes crazy because of some sort of thing, because of pressure or space or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I didn't expect that in such an old movie, though. Like, that seems like quite a modern trope. I did find a lot of things in this movie felt very influential Mm. to other movies. Like, I kind of found it similar to Interstellar Mm. and The Martian and 2001 Space Odyssey that you've mentioned with the spinning space station Mm. and even Silent Running as well. Surely this must have influenced all of those films. Well, I think George Powell's clutch of movies in the 50s really did set the stage for what the serious sci-fi movie would look like. Mm. I mean, he's not quite there. You've still got this ridiculous comic character rumbling around in it. But you look at it and you start seeing there's a visual aesthetic that Kubrick was clearly influenced by for 2001. You can see that in spades. But then there are tropes as well. I mean, there are even individual incidents in this movie, like one character goes out to fix the antenna and ends up being killed and floating away from the spaceship, which exactly happens in 2001 right think about aliens there's a scene where you have all these military types having dinner in a mess hall and at one point they're complaining about cornbread Mm. and you have the jokey loud-mouthed character who's the electronics expert well that's hudson from aliens Mm. at least you actually see him use his electronics expertise at various points in, in aliens which you don't get here there are lots of Little things like the pressure syndrome that turns into the main threat for the characters Mm. that you then see in James Cameron's The Abyss. Mm. There are lots of things in here that I think point towards where sci-fi would go. So we're seeing the germination of all of them, which is really interesting. Yeah, uh, and it's, it's also really interesting. It's 1955. Yeah. Like, I think of all the sort of godfathers of sci-fi in terms of films being 70s. Mm -hmm. This is 20 years earlier. It's insane. It is, yeah. I mean, 2001 was 1968, and and everybody thinks, 
okay, Kubrick came along and just completely changed the entire genre. But he didn't. What Kubrick always used to do when he decided to make a genre movie, he would watch and read everything that had come before, Mm. pick what he liked, Mm -hmm. decide what he was going to do and do it. He did the same with The Shining. So he did his horror movie having watched loads of horror movies. And you can see the things that influenced him that he used and improved upon. And you can see the things he completely invented himself and pointed a way forward. It's part of a continual line of development. Mm. Yeah, this movie does feel like a stepping stone from one era of fantastical, silly, gimmicky sci-fi pre this movie to much more grounded, science-driven sci-fi. Because I feel like sci-fi now, especially space movies, is so airtight with its science. Yeah. Like, you cannot get it wrong or no one will watch that movie (laughs) they they must have so many people um overseeing the science and so many scientists like (laughs) involved in movies now because it's airtight with science yeah it is and we've learned so much as well because we've actually been to space now and been to other planets so but it's amazing how much this movie gets right i mean the surface of mars as seen from orbit is pretty good yeah not so much once they get down to the surface where there's yeah coal sticking up everywhere yeah (laughs) yeah i mean what were they basing this on they had zero footage Mm. of, of people in space people had not been in space yet not till um the first person in space was in 1961 uh, Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin, yeah. uh, a Soviet cosmonaut. Yes. 1961. That's six years away from this movie's uh, release. Mm. That's a pretty astounding that they were actually able to imagine what it would be like with gravity and, and how the spaceship, um, like the seats would swivel around and they would be ended up lying down. It was, yeah. And even the idea of having magnetic boots, as silly as they were, they did think about it. Yeah, they did. And they got the uh, revolving ring for the space station. So the centrifugal force mm. would create artificial gravity. You have a spacewalk scene where they move from one shuttle over to the space station. Although that's, yeah, a little bit ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> very dangerous. They're completely untethered. <laughs> they just float over from the rocket to the space station, <laughs> completely untethered in, in their spacesuits. It's, it's insane. Yeah. But yeah, the <laughs> look of it was correct yeah no i I thought that as well their space suits don't have any means of propulsion yeah and they're just pushed in the general direction of the space station (laughs) in the case of the civilian they just kick him in the ass and he just spirals head over heels towards the space station and they just hope that he gets there so yeah what yeah and then he he just comes out of a space suit and he's in a full suit so he's got a full (laughs) tailored suit on (laughs) underneath the space suit it's it's, it's yeah. the 50s it's i'm ridiculous. 50s businessman point me in the direction of business <laughs> yeah uh, talking about other sort of space science things that they uh, didn't quite get right everyone smokes everywhere yeah like that <laughs> would never happen you can't smoke in space also no. i did kind of laugh i mean it was kind of silly but when they were given the food of the pills each pill was a like this was like roast beef pill and this was a spinach pill yeah it was silly but at least they kind of thought of hey what would people eat in space like what would be the easiest means of eating food whilst everyone else is eating <laughs> roast dinner full <laughs> d- roast dinner with salad and and steak and and everything like I'm pretty sure that's not how they eat up in those space stations right now. No, I'm sure it isn't. But you can see they put some thought into it. Yeah. They just made it disappointingly literal that it ends up being pills for specific foods yeah. rather than just nutrition generally in mm. a paste, which I think is where the space missions landed. Yeah. They just have baby food, don't they, pretty much? Mm-hmm. But Yeah, there, there are various things. I mean, it's quite ridiculous. Originally, they're supposed to be going to the moon and then they just get a, a message from businessman in business suit to say, hey, down on Earth, we've just decided you're going to Mars instead. 
And in case you were wondering, the distance to the moon is about 238,000 miles and takes around three and a half days to get there. Mm. On the other hand, Mars is 33.9 million miles away Mm -hmm. and takes nine months or a 21 month round trip, allowing for the fact that you have to wait for a launch window to get back to Earth again. I thought it took longer. No, apparently. I always thought it took like six years to get to Mars. No, apparently it's 21 months round trip. Wow. So they do that in The Martian, don't they? They go back for another year to rescue Matt Damon. Yeah. But still. It's closer than I thought. (laughs) It's closer than you thought, but it's still not sort of, we're going to go from a three day trip. Yeah. To two years. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, it's a bit ridiculous. It is, it is. <laughs> Some other parts of the film I was surprised about. There's quite a lot of danger in this movie. Mm. The fact that people die, that guy fixing the, the satellite antenna, I guess, does his suit get compromised and his head explodes? Is that what happens? Yeah. is it The f- classic head exploding space death? You have to do it. <laughs> you have to do it. And maybe this is the first one. And it's quite gory, too. In fact, it was so gory, they had to cut stuff out of it. Right. You'll notice it's a bit jumpy, that sequence. It goes from him being hit by a small meteorite his suit exploding around the chest area and then the next there's a jump and then the next time you see him his visor is just red it's yeah just full of yeah it's blood. like outland styles exploding mm. yeah yeah it's pretty gory it's like when they take off and whenever they go through one of these sequences where they're doing like a big burn to get underway or to land or whatever mm, they're mm. all pinned to the floor with blood coming out of their nose and mouths yeah you know it's shown to be a dangerous violent trauma on the body space travel which yeah it's pretty amazing yeah i mean <laughs> I have to say, I don't think I've seen blood in a movie this old. No. You just don't tend to see blood. Not in a space movie. Even Hitchcock movies. Like, I was surprised to see blood in The Birds. No, usually people get shot and fall over. Yeah, you they just hold the see chest. anything. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You might see a bit of ridiculously red paint on their hand if they need to sell it. But sure. usually... Nothing. No, it's quite gruesome for its time. I mean, you know, relatively. I mean, it still looks like red paint in this movie. It doesn't look like blood, but it it was still (laughs) surprising to see it nonetheless. It was. Well, it's still three strip Technicolor. So, yeah, all the colors are very, very vibrant in this movie. Right, right, right. Now it's time for random trivia. So, Dan, what fascinating piece of trivia did you find underneath the red sands of Mars today? Right, so this piece of trivia is not exactly about this film. It's more about space travel. Um, But did you know the first woman in space was a former civilian parachutist, Valentina Tereshkova, uh, entering orbit on June 16th, 1963, aboard the Soviet mission Vostok 6. Because no one ever talks about the first woman in space. No. They talk about chimpanzees, dogs, and Yuri Gagarin. Yeah. But no... (laughs) Yes, I've never heard that fact. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. I was really fascinated by that. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a good piece of trivia. <laughs> <laughs> that's a <our> trivia. <laughs> so thinking about other elements of the film, what did you make of the score, Dan? Yeah, so it's scored by Van Cleave who I have never heard of, uh, apparently has done a lot of orchestration, um, mostly uncredited for a a lot of movies. But yeah, I've never heard of this composer. I like the score. It did feel kind of radio drama-y, like it was very theatrical. Uh, It felt like it was a radio-sized orchestra as well, so a lot to kind of strip back. Yeah, Um, yeah, a lot of brass and strings. Wasn't what I expected for sci-fi of that decade. I thought there was going to be theremin and more organ or maybe early electronic music um, instruments, Mm. but it was very grounded and almost like adventure 
action adventure type music yeah very much with one exception one cue that keeps recurring or a motif that i really like which is these floating two chords that he has on tremolo strings and soprano voices mm. for the space scenes that's really sort of mysterious and um shimmering and strange and yeah yeah i love it it's really good yeah it, it was a very emotive score like it was kind of teetering on like fantasy magical almost mm. like it has a lot of chromatic movement i think it wasn't theme heavy but it was still quite memorable like lots of brass yes and uh fanfares and and it feels like a war score to be honest it feels like a score for a war movie right in some places okay. ah, it's quite militaristic it's a very militaristic view of uh the space exploration which again turned out to be quite accurate certainly for the early stages before billionaires started firing <laughs> william shatner into space for no reason yeah 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 it does feel quite martial in a few places I mm. thought. But I liked it generally. I mean, sometimes it does do things that are a little bit over demonstrative, like the Christmas carol that seeps in for the Christmas miracle at the end of the yeah. movie. Yeah, I was a bit surprised by that. Like, it, it seemed unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess to show the passage of time or to show the sort of resilience and the holding on to traditions maybe mm. but uh yeah it seemed a bit out of place yeah for the most part i thought the music was very good the sound not so much no this, i mean it's the 50s did they even do foley work back then <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound like it no yeah yeah i mean they did fairly well with um rockets and hardware and the sounds of yeah. meteorites i mean they take liberties with the idea that there wouldn't be any sound in space for sure because there's lots of it <laughs> oh well and also it's pre first man in space anyway so you know there's a lot of liberties there mm. uh, one thing i noted that is often in movies that wasn't in this movie sound wise is um when they have the helmets on normally they have like you know the radio voice they just sounded like they just had plastic helmets on yeah. <laughs> like <it's, laughs> yeah. it, the helmets did nothing they weren't airtight or anything it was just yeah no they were just like buckets over their head weren't they? yeah yeah well my <laughs> wife uh, pointed out they looked like rubbish bins like turned upside down <laughs> yeah you they know? do it's just right <laughs> <laughs> yeah but generally the production design is pretty amazing i mean certainly the set of the rocket or spaceship that they're in the rocket was great it's good yeah i mean that single continuous wing for a spaceship which was based on a sort of wing bomber right which you see in indiana jones i think oh okay that design is pretty amazing the rocket when they're landing and the the heat shield sort of folds back over the cockpit so that mm. you can see out the windows when they're landing and they're as you said their chairs swiveling yeah the sort of things that you would see in interstellar years later i mean it's mm. it's pretty good it's pretty good it's pretty good and, and even um that sort of first meteor surge that they have on the space station and everyone just gets flung mm. to the floor it's a good effect i mean it's probably just a tilted soundstage but um they did very well with like what looked like quite limited means yeah it is limited means and i think sometimes that shows that george powell was having a bit of a fight with paramount over the budget for this movie right and unfortunately the film that's put out was not finished so particularly mm. the optical effects in the movie look like they're the first pass so you have a lot of uh, what's known as chattering mat lines around spaceships ah. so instead of being fixed and solid the sort of flashing and so on it's because yeah it's like the first pass just to see what the composition looks like and then they were supposed to go back and do them wow. properly Interesting. and then right at the end of the movie when the mars quake happens yeah yeah there's a glitch. <laughs> there's a glitch because there's all of the characters in the foreground and then towards the end of the shot, they just disappear. Yeah. And all you can see is the miniature plate behind it because they just, I don't know, forgot, didn't yeah. finish it. 
Yeah. So they vanish. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing. Yeah. Because it's still in the movie. Yeah. So, yeah, they didn't finish the movie and um, it looks a bit shoddy here and there. Yeah, the chattering stuff I didn't realise was like just the first pass. I thought, oh, it's just early blue screen stuff. Because mm. you see that on like Zoom calls, you know, when people put like yes, a different yeah. background and it's, yeah. it kind of <laughs> glitches in and out of the background and, and, and the person in the foreground. So I thought it was that. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's disappointing that they didn't get to properly finish the visual effects. No, they didn't. And so the finished film is not one that George Powell would talk about at great length afterwards. Oh, wow. He was, by all accounts, a very gentle man, a very kind man who avoided conflict and he would never really talk about his failures or bad mouth anybody. Mm. He would just move on to the next thing. So he left Paramount and went to MGM and then did things like Tom Thumb, which was a massive hit, and The Time Machine, which was a massive hit. And wow. So his career survived this, but this is, it's regarded as a missed opportunity or the yeah. greatest disappointment of George Powell's career. Mm, right, right, right. Because I was a bit underwhelmed by the visual effects. Like, it is f- 1955, so of course, you know, they had very limited means of, uh, in terms of visual effects. But a lot of the scenes did look quite Thunderbirdsy, yeah, <laughs> like and not in a good way. Yeah, like some of the rockets looked like obvious miniatures, and when he crashed in on Mars, it does look great, but it does also look like an obvious miniature that they crash landing on. Because when you compare it to War of the Worlds, mm. which came out three years or was it two years before this movie, it's astounding visual effects for that film yeah um and also because this director um byron haskin is known for like uh sort of sea movies like a lot of (laughs) movies with ships and galleys and and boats oh yeah and looking at that footage it's all miniatures but they look incredible like Mm. they uh, flawless they look like the real deal. Yeah. So he was an expert at this kind of stuff. He was kind of a journeyman director. He obviously wasn't the kind of director who would look at the script and say, hey, this isn't working. Let's figure out how to fix this because he just shot this script as it came to him and it's crap. Mm. But in terms of visual effects, he was sort of the leader in that field and did, when he had the budget and the time, did produce things that were amazing like War of the Worlds. Mm. But then when he didn't... Yeah, it didn't go so well. Yeah. So he's directed a film called Robinson Crusoe on Mars, I think. Yes. Which sounds batshit. I mean, I would love to watch it. And I guess it it was his sort of redeeming sci-fi after this movie. Yeah, his personal favourite. It's kind of The Martian. Yeah, it sounds like it. It is, yeah. I think it is. I don't think he grows potatoes in his own poo, but I think... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it basically is a guy getting stranded on Mars trying to survive. So, yeah, mm. quite the precursor again. And he also directed Treasure Island, right? Which was the first live action Walt Disney film, mm. which I think I've seen because I was huge into the classics when I was a kid. I, I read Treasure Island, Three Musketeers and A Man in Iron Mask and all those sort of classic books. So I, I definitely would have watched that movie. And again, that one was considered to be shockingly violent for its time as well, because there's a point in it where a child shoots a pirate in the face. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So pushing boundaries even then. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Moobly Awards! Okay, it's the Moobly Awards, it's where we present our favourite asteroid avoiding parts of the film in a number of space conquering categories. Best quote. My favourite quote in this movie comes when. Our favourite character, Sergeant Jackie Siegel, floats out of his magnetic boots because he hasn't zipped them up. And General Merritt says, we'll have no unnecessary floating aboard this ship. (laughs) Yes, yes, that was my my backup quote. Yeah, it's a good one. 
Uh, so my favorite quote, it's a profound one. It's when General Merritt is getting all like existential about religion and space travel. And uh, he says, the biblical limitations on man's wanderings are set down as being from the four corners of the earth. Not Mars or Jupiter or infinity. The question is, Barney, what are we? Explorers or invaders? Mm. I really like that. Like it's it's kind of analyzing colonialism and and you yes. know exploring other countries. Were you exploring or were you invading? Well, always invading in the case of the British Empire, yeah. as yeah. he said. Best hair or costume? My favourite costume was the spacesuits, just because when they took them yeah. off. Uh, they, <laughs> the arms on them just looked like slinkies that would just bounce around. Yeah. <laughs> which I found hysterical. I mean, the whole suit just looked like they'd just gone to the local hardware store and just <laughs> duct taped a whole bunch of stuff together. They've got a rubbish bin for the helmet. They've got some ventilation, like corrugated tubing for the arms. And they've just like strapped two uh, fire extinguishers to their back. Uh, to look like yeah. oxygen, to os- oxygen tanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had the spacesuits as my my uh, nomination as well. Most fifties moment. I thought the most fifties thing about this movie was just the optimism about our limitless progress and our f- magical future in space together. It was all a bit sort of gee whiz, and we're all going to be up there in space stations. Mm. It's, I think it's notable that Disneyland opened the same year, nineteen fifty five with Tomorrowland, with its promise Ah, of this bright sci-fi future that everybody thought that they were on the brink of in 1955. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I couldn't really pick anything. I don't really know the 50s that well. (laughs) Sci-fi in colour? Is is that a thing? Like, uh, I guess everything pre fifties uh, sci fi wise wasn't in color or wasn't in like Technicolor. No, that's true. I guess that's the only thing I could pick out. Favorite scene. My favorite scene. All the scenes requiring depicting gravity. Mm-hmm. It's really fascinating. Like w- their choices. <laughs> Sometimes there was gravity. And sometimes it wasn't <laughs> gravity. It was very inconsistent, but it was it was still really fascinating to watch in such an old film. Mm. There's still something they have problems with now. Like if you watch Interstellar, sometimes you know they're fully up on wires and floating around. And sometimes I think Anne Hathaway was saying that they just had to sort of stand on one leg and to sort of just float a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, well. It worked. Mm. How about your favourite scene? My favourite scene was Fodor's death by meteorite, just because it was fairly exciting. Ah. It's right after the the ship has to do this drastic U-turn to dodge an enormous asteroid that's chasing it. Yes. And then Fodor is hit by one of this sudden sort of projectile swarm of meteors, little mini ones that fly past and his chest explodes and his face plate fills with blood and then Mm. he's just sort of hanging outside on a tether with blood all over the dome on the ship. Yeah. One of the characters, I think it's Jackie actually, starts screaming for him to go away they wish that he'd float off because they don't like seeing him there so it's it's pretty grim (laughs) pretty shocking Mm. most cliche moment i was struggling to find sci-fi cliches in this movie because i was finding mostly war movie cliches Ah. like the devoted sergeant that sort of strangely idolizes his commanding officer to the point where he's prepared to stow away and threaten people with violence if they besmirch his legacy Mm, mm. (laughs) yeah and offering him cups of tea in the parlor yeah there's there's something going on there it's 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 all very hobo-erotic in much the same way that sam and sam and frodo in lord of the rings have that batman and commanding officer relationship that's just Uh. a little bit too idolizing to be right Right. Yeah. So th- there's that. There's the doomed soldier with the message from his mother who dies shortly afterwards. The whole battalion whooping at a girly film, which you mentioned earlier. Mm. So there's loads of war movie cliches in this one. Yeah, I guess they they were trying to make it a, uh, relatable. 
I guess, because yeah, I guess sci-fi so. is just too out there. Yeah, and war movies have been massive, obviously, the previous decade for obvious reasons. Mm, so I mm. guess it was just a genre that people were familiar with. So it's just like a war movie in space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the two cliches that I picked out, first of all, exploding heads in space. Of course, yes. I, I, I'm pretty sure every single space movie has an exploding head in space or exploding bodies in space, something to do with exploding. <laughs> Uh, and also, yeah, fixing a faulty part of the ship always involves extreme danger uh, where someone explodes uh, or or is is untethered and floats off into the uh, the, the void of space or, or doesn't can't make an airlock or, or something like that. There's a, don't just don't fix any part of your ship. Uh, <laughs> if something goes wrong, just leave it be. It'll be fine because you can't yeah, if, go out there. If, <laughs> best special effect. Well, I'm going to be pretty repetitive and say it's the mini meteorites hitting Fodor because I, I think those are really well visualized. They're just uh-huh. bright streaks of light. And uh, the explosion on his spacesuit is pretty good as well. So mm. some of the exterior spaceship shots are pretty good. Yeah. When they haven't got chattering mat lines, but most of them are a little bit rough around the edges. Mm, yeah, really rough. I, I wouldn't say this was the best special effect, but I was uh, kind of amused by the asteroid, which for some reason just looked like a big, round, uh, glowing paper mache ball. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> they didn't make it rocky <laughs> enough. It looked very spherical, very round. Don't yes. know why. <laughs> no, I guess just the lack of experience of what asteroids actually are. I guess that's yeah. the one sort of pulpy comic booky thing in the movie. <laughs> mm, mm. Favorite sound effect? Yeah, not a lot of sound, as I mentioned in this movie. Uh, <laughs> the rockets, I guess. It's always interesting to hear how rockets sound in sci-fi. Uh, these had a very high-pitched sort of squealing noise to them like almost like a kettle yeah. it was quite <laughs> piercing um, but you know the g- general sort of low sort of white noisy thrusty rockets were also there as well yeah well my favourite sound editing moment rather than sound effect itself yeah. is the sudden contrast between that harsh distorting rocket burn noise when they set off for Mars followed by this sudden and abrupt silence when they cut the rocket off right and then in comes van cleve's mysterioso heavenly mysterious music and it's such a nice contrast between the all the noise and fury uh and danger of of the first part of it i just thought that's a really great sound editing Mm. moment Right, right, right. Most, Most funniest, funniest moment. moment. So my funniest scene, definitely unintentional, was uh, when they were going at max speed or warp speed, whatever they want to call it. Um, and I don't know why. I mean, I, I know that they were trying to sort of portray the effect of like, you know, G-force on their faces. So they're, they're going very fast and there's like wind blowing and the faces their faces are getting pulled back. But it just looks like a horror movie. Like, what? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, the eyes were rolling at the back of their heads. Like, it's like their, their faces were made out of plasticine and they were just getting distorted. And it was terrifying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're all gurning for, um, for England there. And yeah, it's pretty shocking. It's quite a startling effect. Apparently, this is the same thing they did on Destination Moon, although I haven't seen that movie. They they created a special contraption that would like grip the edges of their face and right. just like pull it downwards in a really weird, really? yeah, progressively oh, pull it. Wow. So it, it reminds me of that happens in Moonraker, the uh, seventy nine Bond movie with Roger Moore in it. He gets put in one of these centrifugal force astronaut oh, training right. devices and flown around far too fast. And I think they did that just by firing a jet in his face. Right. <laughs> so, so yeah, he suddenly gets a rather drastic facelift with all of his skin being pushed in all kinds of directions. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty 
horrifying and not accurate at all. This is not the way G-Force works right, in the right. slightest. Okay, okay. Uh, well, the moment that made me roar with laughter was after they'd been on Mars for some time running out of water because the general had gone bonkers and gotten rid of it all. Uh, it snowed and Christmas music started to play. Yeah. And I oh. thought, what is this? Is this oh a Frank God. Capra movie? What are you doing? Yeah. Uh, and that's our move, mm. please. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lance Guest, and you're listening to Movie Oubliette. Okay, it's that final part of the pod. Uh, final verdicts. Should 1955's conquest of space be thrust into outer space and beam down on all of us to a door? Or should its head explode in a meteor surge and be thrown back into the oubliette to be forgotten from sci-fi history? Conrad. Conquest of space. Delivered to us by our fans and by Via Vision. Shout out to Via Vision. Mm. Well, what's your final verdict for this movie? Well, I think it's an important stepping stone, as you've said, from one era of sci-fi to another. But whereas it's not one of the milestones like Destination Moon and War of the Worlds and The Time Machine, some of the other films that George Powell produced, this is quite famously the one that was a bit of a disaster, both because of its script, which I find uh, preposterous and irritating. <laughs> the comedy relief is terrible. Um, I take your point that they're engaging with a, a bigger sort of colonialist story with the religious man gone mad and paranoid mm. story, but... I didn't find the whole man goes crazy because of religion and turns into a saboteur who's even hell-bent on killing his own son thing particularly convincing. I didn't find the father-son thing particularly engaging either. So the script is bad. The special effects aren't very well polished or finished. Uh, I'm glad that Via Vision has done this amazing release with all of these commentaries and extras, and it was very kind of them to supply it. It's great that they've done it because this film has been very hard to find mm. because it failed for a very long time. It was very difficult to see it. So I would say if you're a huge fan of the genre and you want to see a film that undoubtedly Kubrick watched before doing 2001 and one of the film's that created many of the genre tropes that uh, we're all so familiar with now, by all means, check it out. It's worth doing. But as a film, do I think it's an enjoyable film to watch? Is it an engaging, effective piece of filmmaking? Absolutely not, no. <laughs> so... I would puncture that thing and let the visor fill up with blood and then and then send it hurling <laughs> off into space, uh, to be honest. But uh, it's a tricky one because it is an important film yeah. in many ways, but it's not a very good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I, I will give it a little bit of leeway because it is from 1955. That, that was a long time ago. Mm. Um, and this movie does touch on a lot of very modern tropes for sci-fi that I did not expect from 1955. Uh, yes, it's it's not a, it's not a perfect film by any means. Uh, there are problems with all the things that you've mentioned. Um, I mean, even visual effects wise, it could have been so much better. But, you know, studio mm. interference and, and all that sort of stuff, uh, it's it's a shame. I think for me, this movie is such a sort of time piece. It's almost like a, a piece of forgotten history that I, I think people would be fascinated to watch. Uh, yeah, I, okay, it's not the most enjoyable film. It's a little dated. <laughs> um, it's, it's not, you know, a classic like 2001 or War of the Worlds. Um but I think it is like a historical um, timepiece of, of cinema that is, is worth a watch if, if you want to see sort of the progression of sci-fi as well. Like I, I'm, I am really fascinated by sci-fi as a cinematic genre that hmm. didn't really sort of flourish until visual effects caught up mm. like it was very hard to do sci-fi as a genre pre 
CGI even. Like it, it was tough. It was a very tough genre to pull off. And yeah, I, I, I'm very fascinated with how it originated and, and this this movie, Conquest of Space, is that sort of missing link between sort of the old world of sci-fi and then sort of modern, more scientific world. So I would recommend this movie to sort of more sci-fi, oh. sci-fi fans. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, that means our 101st episode. <laughs> the first episode since our centenary is going to be Down to the Coin. Yes. The Coin of Fate. Okay, Danny, are you going to go for heads or rocket tails? Oh, ah, uh, well, you said it like that. I'm going to go for rocket tails. Okay, here we go. Ooh. Oh. Oh. <laughs> It's tails. <sighs> you always win the coin toss. I That's don't... something I didn't do <laughs> <laughs> for our one hundredth. I was going to look at the stats for how often ah. you win the coin toss. I don't. Th- I, I think it's a pretty fair, fair winnings <laughs> on, on both of our parts. But um, I'm very happy with that result. Okay. Yes. Con- conquest of space lives again. It conquers after all. <laughs> Off you go, conquest of space. Fly. <laughs> Rocket away. Oh, uh, well, huge thanks uh, to our uh, viewers or listeners of, of the live stream that, that chose that film for us. And, of course, to Via mm. Vision for gifting us the film to talk about with all those great extras. I was at the extras, the, the featurettes were fascinating to watch. There's, a, there's pretty much an expose or sort of like a biography of Byron Haskin in one of the featurettes, which was, uh, yeah. Really, really, really interesting. Yes, and the two commentaries, uh, one by a historian who looks after George Powell's estate, Justin Humphreys, uh, is fascinating, and then Barry Forshaw and Kim Newman, a pair of British critics and experts in uh, sci-fi and horror, do a commentary too. They're, it's a really good package. Uh, Via Vision always do amazing Blu-ray special editions, so it's well worth checking them out. Yeah, And I'm not just saying that because they gave us a freebie. I buy their stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. But it was a really good insight in, into cinema history, like um, sort of the, the progression of, of George Powell and um, Byron Haskin um, and, and mm. all the films that they, they did together and, and sort of subsequent films. So it was, mm, yeah, I learned a lot. Yeah, it's a fascinating package. So if you are interested in this genre and this feels like something that would fascinate you, then do check it out. Yes. Yes. And if you mm. are fascinated by our podcast, you can look forward <laughs> to our future episodes by following us on all social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Reddit. And why not watch our live stream on YouTube as well uh, if you didn't catch it <laughs> live. And you can email us at movie.oubliet at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support the show, then you can head on over to Patreon, where for as little as a dollar, you can nominate and vote on films for us to uh, cover in future episodes and get extra extended parts of the show. And for $5, you get access to exclusive extended interviews with our special guests and a monthly minisode which we now do by video, possibly live stream. You never know. Mm. We might live stream them. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, and mm. we have merchandise as well on Redbubble, everything you can uh, decor- You would want to decorate your house with or maybe your garden studio. Uh, just head on, <laughs> head on over to Redbubble. <laughs> I do have a movie oubliette cushion on the sofa behind me. Yes. And I'm thinking about getting a clock too for oh. that wall. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, loads of amazing stuff at Redbubble. So, Conrad, what's on the cards for next episode? Well, we thought we would do something fantasy-based for our next episode, because it's been a while since we've done some fantasy. And we thought we'd leap forward from 1955 all the way to 2006 to cover the M. Night Shyamalan movie... Lady in the Water. Oh, okay. Well, that's uh, going to be interesting. That director for me is very hit and miss. 
Uh, so I'm hoping for a hit, <laughs> but it might be a miss. <laughs> yes, this is something that uh, you've been circling for a while because I think you uh, stopped watching Shyamalan movies after a yeah. while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I gave up. I did give up. Um, I, there have been some good ones. I, I liked Split. I thought that was a good movie. Um, but mm. yeah, for the most part, uh, a lot of the happenings uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this had a budget of 70 million and a box office of 72.8, so it did not find its audience on release. Right. So we shall review it again to see whether we were all wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> Looking forward to that. <laughs> okay, well, thanks everyone for listening. It's been a blast as always. Yes, uh, until next time for Lady in the Water. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Steak, mushrooms, asparagus.